sign from the boss, so uh, we'll get started, folks. I see there are uh, 13, well, I guess 11 people out there. So uh, I'm Roger, and I'll be your uh, instructor for the next couple hours. And uh, let me first explain, this is a, a, a webinar that's based on a study that was done in, in, in 2012, uh, sponsored by the National Renewable Energy Lab. And uh, the whole objective of this study was to determine whether by 2050 it would be possible for the United States to have a portfolio of 90% renewable energy. And after asking a whole lot of questions about exactly how that would happen, uh, it was a resounding, yes, absolutely, probably can do better, even faster kind of an answer. So, and especially when we look at where we've come already by now in 2020, based on the 2012 study. So we're going to be talking about what some of the challenges are. We are not going to design a pumped hydro energy storage facility, for example, nor are we going to do any major design work. Anybody who's interested in design work, we do have a battery backup photovoltaic systems design webinar that you might want to take a look at because we go into gory detail on design uh, sizing and all that kind of stuff on that one. But this one, we want to look at the concepts and just to give people the faith that the technology is here and it's going to get better and so forth. So, uh, what we're going to start with is this small photovoltaic systems because uh, basically if we can show that these things have been working and fact of the matter is they have, I've designed a lot of them personally, <clears throat> started doing that back in about uh, the year 2000 in fact when there were some people who were worried about uh, uh, the clocks changing and the world coming to an end as uh, we quick past the midnight hour in the year 2000. And, and strangely enough, the sun rose that very next morning on J January 1st, 2000. And the clocks were still running and everything else was still working. And, and uh, photovoltaics were still uh, getting better and better and better and have been for the last 20 years. So um, the very first systems out there were standalone with battery backup. Okay, and by the way, let me just say that uh, uh, this is, I think, maybe coming through full screen on your screen, but uh, if you hover around the, the edges, and you've had enough, I'm sure everybody here has attended lots and lots of Zoom meetings by now. Uh, if there's any one good thing that may have come from the, uh, the pandemic, I can't remember the last time I was at an in-person meeting, and yet uh, when I hear of a meeting that's happening 200 miles from me, I, I, I jump right in and sign up because I don't have a 400 mile drive up and back. Uh, so there's some advantages here. Uh, we have the ultimate social distancing. I'm assuming most of the folks are up in the New England area and I'm, I'm uh, down here in, uh, in, in the Palm Beach, Florida area. Uh, probably kind of preferring to be up in New England where there's not quite as much COVID going on. But anyway, enough uh, editorializing. Uh, way back in the 19, late 70s, 1980s and so forth, uh, the photovoltaics were basically that, that uh, cabin in the woods with a little opening where you could get a little sunlight on the photovoltaic modules and you'd store that electricity and batteries so you could get some lights on at night and maybe run a DC refrigerator and so forth. So uh, because these systems have been around for so long, they've uh, seen a lot of time for getting the kinks ironed out and they are now uh, uh, not only serving DC loads, in fact, serving very few DC loads now, other than when they converted from 120 volts AC to be able to charge up a five volt phone or computer. Uh, but then inverters were added First inverters were pretty simple. They were square waves and you try to run a refrigerator on a square wave with all of its harmonics. Your refrigerator burns out prematurely. The compressor does because of uh, additional heating. Uh, but then uh, 
folks figured out how to design very good sine wave inverters that operate at very high efficiency. And that was what was needed to tie into the grid because the grid needs uh, uh, grid quality sine waves. And uh, in fact, it's now possible to do even better than the grid connection with electronic inverters. So, uh, that, like I say here, the, the inverters had to keep the grid happy, which means that the IEEE got busy and, and they uh, came up with IEEE 1547 in 2003, which was a follow up on IEEE 1741 before that. And then the Underwriters Laboratories adopted 1741 as the testing procedure to verify that 1547 is being met by the inverters. And uh, this means that anything that's not utility equipment that's going to be connected to the grid has to comply with IEEE 1547. And uh, in 2020, 1547 uh, was changed to adapt to grid needs, meaning that in 2003 and up through 2020, IEEE 1547 required an inverter to go offline if it lost the line power or if the line frequency went too low or too high or if the line voltage went too high or too low. But it would became pretty evident with the 100 megawatt utility systems out there that if the utility were stressed and the utility frequency were going down, the last thing they want to do is have a 100 megawatt system go down. They want to keep it running. So now the IEEE 1547-2000 allows a, an agreement to be negotiated between the utility and the owner of the system, which might be the utility itself anyway, but uh, uh, depending on where you are. And the utility then can control the uh, photovoltaic or wind farm uh, to the extent that they can keep it running to keep the grid healthy or they can shut it down if necessary. So that, that's a very important step that was taken and it's just happened about uh, uh, the spring of 2020. So I kind of hinted that inverters are what's important. So let's talk a little bit about them, uh, especially battery backup grid connected inverters because we're talking about storage and uh, there's other storage means, but they ultimately create electricity, so batteries create electricity by means of applying the DC out of the batteries to the inverter to convert it to AC. And what the battery backup grid connect inverters do is when they're feeding the grid, they act as current sources. Now that may not seem very significant, but fact of the matter is quite significant because the grid itself is basically a voltage source. And if the inverter uses that voltage source and the waveform form from the voltage source as a synchronizing signal, it can assure that the current coming out of the inverter is always in phase with the voltage. That's important because if you can imagine in the mechanical analog of this, if you have two systems vibrating more or less sinusoidally and you want to connect a, a bar between the two so they can run together. Um, I think we may have, we have a question here. Let, let, let's see if we have a question. Uh, Q&A, how are the regulators handling the deal that the power companies make with the renewable? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think the regulators have given the power companies the, uh, wow, you know, nobody's ever asked that before. Obviously it's working because I don't think IEEE would have gone to the bother of extending uh, the, the uh, uh, standard up to the 2000 version unless the power companies and the uh, photovoltaic people weren't uh, pushing the regulators. And of course, the really big systems are m largely owned by the power company. So in that case, it's basically the re uh, power company telling the regulators that uh, uh, we're going to treat this photovoltaic source like any other source 
and we're going to keep it on to make sure the grid stays stable and uh, turn it off only if there's a threat to the power source to, to some other part of the system. But, so that, that's my best guess at an answer, and I have to tell you that's a good question. Um, if you have more information than that, I would invite you to uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, explain where that, that question came from, because not everybody would necessarily even know to ask that question. All right, so uh, let's see, it's from an anonymous attendee. You don't have to be anonymous, you can actually tell me who you are. Uh, for the moment though, we'll say, uh, person anonymous to allow for the possibility of any gender. Okay, uh, so that, that, that's the uh, answer. I'm gonna close out the question unless I see my, uh, my light flashing again on my screen. Uh, the, the current source thing is very important though because uh, the inverters electronically can be current limited so that the maximum current they deliver is limited to maybe 20 amps, 16 amps, or, or maybe a thousand amps if it's a big one, uh, or, or more than a thousand amps for that matter. So, um, but the significance of current source is that it's easily, to, it's very easy to synchronize uh, the current source with the voltage source. And, and not only that, but uh, IEEE, uh, 1547-2000 also allows the power, the, the utility some control over the power factor of the generation so that if the utility power factor is low or, or ne uh, uh, negative, uh, react, uh, say inductive, uh, the inverter can effectively come in with a capacitive uh, a, as though there were a big capacitor there because it's simply a matter of telling it what phase angle to maintain as a difference between the current and the voltage. Uh, if the grid goes down and if the battery backup system is, is feeding standby loads that are isolated from the grid, then they have to act as voltage sources because uh, if they act as current sources, they have nothing there to synchronize them. And at some point, their voltage frequency uh, or their, the, the frequency of the output signal uh, departs from the limits allowed by IEEE 1547 and the inverter would shut down. So they have to act as voltage sources and maintain very accurate 60 Hertz frequency or 50 if you're in a 50 Hertz uh, location. Okay, uh, oh, another question. Let's see what we've got. Uh, there is no another question. That's the same one that was there last time. Hmm, I thought that, oh, okay. I, I'm gonna click and I answered that live. And I did, and we're done. So maybe that question, okay, good. That question went away. Okay, uh, when the grid is up and the sun is down, these battery backup inverters can actually charge the batteries. So they, they rectify, they take the, the AC from the grid and they charge up the batteries uh, up to whatever voltage you pre-program pre uh, the inverter to charge the batteries. Uh, oftentimes you don't want the grid to fully charge the batteries because you want the sun to do that. So when you want the sun to charge the batteries, you wait until nighttime and then whatever is missing, you let the grid uh, finish that off. But there's, there's all kinds of, I'm sure you can imagine other scenarios where you wanna keep your batteries fully charged all the time so that if there is a loss of grid power, you're gonna get maximum backup power from your battery. So either of those are possible scenarios. Okay, and uh, the battery voltage is the input, which is typically uh, in the neighborhood of about 52 volts uh, or nominal 48 volts. Uh, these battery backup grid connected inverters don't have to do maximum power point tracking. And that simply means that uh, the solar array uh, in order to operate at maximum power needs to be controlled to do that. 
And in the battery backup DC system, the maximum power point tracking is done with an external uh, charge controlling device. Uh, and the ground fault detection interruption, arc fault circuit interruption also are functions that are done externally to the grid connected inverter. And here I have to correct myself again, unless it's a grid connected inverter that in fact has been designed to incorporate these other features that would otherwise be in external components because after all that's additional wiring, extra uh, installation cost. If you can have this all factory wired in a single box, makes life a whole lot simpler for the installer, which in fact is the direction that things are going. And to a great extent, this is how the systems are presently being installed. We're gonna see some block diagrams in a short time to see exactly what uh, the functional things are. Uh, there has to be a rapid shutdown system in a battery backup grid connected uh, system. If it's in a building to make sure that there's no high voltage coming from the array down to uh, uh, actually anywhere, you can't have high voltage leaving the array period, whether it's AC or DC, uh, it needs to be shut down. And uh, they don't make much noise, certainly not as much noise as a gasoline generator. And they, they certainly don't pollute when the grid is down. Uh, whether it's gasoline, natural gas, whatever, you ever been downwind from a natural gas generator, say a 15 kW unit, they don't smell very good. Uh, and uh, these battery backup systems, they save on gas uh, and trips to the gas station as well when the grid is down because every day they, the sun fills the batteries back up again or almost does. And of course, if it doesn't, then there may be some need to do something. Uh, and there's UL 1741 compliant, which is required of anything that's connected to the grid. Okay, uh, look at some types. There's DC coupled systems, and uh, uh, I'm not gonna read all these slides necessarily because uh, all you need to do is you can download the copy of the slides after the program. Um, Either you'll get a, 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 an email from, uh, well, actually, you, you'll get instructions at the end. Uh, PDH will, Hisham will, will give instructions for how to download the slides after we're done. So you don't have to take notes really fast unless you want to make a note of a question you want to ask. Okay, so we've got a schematic of this coming up. So we'll go through this uh, slide on the schematic. And the other kind are AC coupled systems. And again, we have a schematic, so we'll go straight to the schematic diagrams. Here's the DC coupled system. And it starts with the photovoltaic array. And the photovoltaic array very likely will have six, eight, 10 circuits running in parallel. So it's just like a, uh, you, you could almost imagine this as a standard electrical AC distribution system. And then you've got your main panel and you got some fat wires coming in from the utility and you got a bunch of smaller wires going out to the loads. Well, imagine the source circuit combiner box is just the opposite of that, where you got a bunch of small wires coming in from the source and they'll be like probably number 10 or number 12 from the, in the array. And then the outputs get combined at the source circuit combiner box so that the fat wires go to the charge controller. Uh, and there's typically a surge arrestor connected at the location of the combiner box. Simply to, if there's a lightning surge or something that affects the array, you would like for a nut to blow up all the electronics in your inverters and charge controllers. So the surge arrestor helps with that. <clears throat> Notice the directions of the arrows. We're talking about one-way power transfer from the array to the source circuit combiner box, one-way transfer to the charge controller. The charge controller is the black box that, that measures the power coming in from the source circuit combiner box. And it remembers that power. And then it changes the it, there's actually an, an interrupt, a square wave type interruption of the input. Uh, power and it effectively it's a DC to DC converter. 
And, and what it does, and as DC to DC converters are all over the place now, especially in electric vehicles, for example, but uh, the array might be running at say 120 volts. In fact, it could be running up as high as four or 500 volts, depending on the charge controller choice. And, uh, but the maximum power voltage of the array, let's say it's 90 volts. And if that's the, where the maximum power comes out of the array at that voltage, then the charge controller will maintain the array voltage at 90 and maximize the power to the system. I mean, why buy the possibility of making that much power if you can't do it? So the charge controller is a pretty important part of the system. And sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, a charge controller is actually incorporated inside the battery backup inverter node. The chargers, charge controller's job is to charge the batteries. So, and you'll notice there's a one-way arrow from the charge controller going down to that junction point there between the batteries and the inverter. The batteries, they store energy if they're low on energy, and they give off energy if the inverter needs it. When the batteries are full, all of the output of the charge controller goes to the battery backup inverter. All right, and the battery backup inverter is, can, is programmable, so it will, it will you, you, you tell the uh, storage batteries uh, when, uh, like for example, you tell the inverter, you, as soon as the batteries are up to 52 volts, then uh, the inverter will start drawing power from the batteries. So then this uh, fancy green inverter, what happens is uh, uh, the pr first priority is the standby load. So whether it's utility or whether it's the photovoltaic array power or whether it is combination of the two, the needs of the standby loads are met first. Okay, and if the standby loads, whatever they may be, lighting, computer, refrigerator, washing machine, who knows what, could be the whole house now with some of the bigger systems. Um, as soon as the needs of these loads are met, then power is delivered to the distribution panel where the power from the photovoltaic system is connected into the rest of the world, which means the rest of the loads in the house and utility. So. If there's some power left over from the standby loads, it goes to whatever loads are connected in the distribution panel. And if there's still some power left over, it gets sold back to the utility. Okay, so just that simple, utility goes down, the connection between the brown box and the green box goes, uh, it, it's disconnected from, a, uh, the, I mean, the control system is still there, but the, otherwise the, there's no power transfer. And the battery switches over to become a voltage source instead of a current source, not the battery, the battery backup inverter becomes a uh, AC voltage source and it runs the standby loads. And the power for running standby loads comes from the batteries and or the sun. So uh, that's the DC coupled system. Um, fair amount of wiring involved in it, but uh, they work pretty well. Uh, first one, well, no, I guess it was the third one that, that I installed. It was at a friend of mine, uh, somewhere in the 2006 neighborhood, and uh, he has uh, had some repair on the inverter, but otherwise the batteries and the systems been working fine ever since. So it's, uh, as long as you don't mess around with it, it's pretty much a plug and play system with very little, ma very little maintenance. Okay, let's look at an AC coupled system. What's different? By the way, the, the, the overall efficiency to the loads with the DC coupled system is typically in the 94 to 95% range and sometimes lower if there's no utility power available because there's a 10% loss in and out of the batteries. With the AC system, you notice there's two inverters now. We've got a direct grid connected inverter and that one is meeting IEEE 1741, not IEEE, UL 1741, which means that if the utility is lost, and we follow the utility down through the distribution panel, down through the battery backup inverter, 
out of the battery backup inverter, out of the AC out termination to the standby load panel. The utility delivers a synchronizing voltage to the standby loads by way of the distribution panel and the battery backup inverter. That utility voltage then acts as a synchronizing signal for the PV power that goes to the direct grid connect inverter. And the direct grid connect inverter then is able to generate lots of uh, power, lots of energy. Standby loads get first choice of it. And if the utility is there, anything extra in the standby loads goes through the battery backup inverter up to the distribution panel. And if there's still some left over, it goes back to the utility. There's other modes of operation here. For example, if the utility goes down, then the battery backup inverter goes into the voltage source mode. The direct grid connector inverter which is connected, they're both connected to the bus bar or the standby panel. So the direct grid connect converter thinks the battery backup inverter is the utility. So it's perfectly happy to uh, absorb power from the PV array and deliver it to the standby loads. But now that's the only place that power can go is to the standby loads or to the batteries. All right. And once the standby loads are happy and the batteries are full, then there has to be a little communication between the green inverter and the blue inverter because the green one has to tell the blue one to back off a little bit because uh, everything is happy. Uh, and, and, but that, that's, that's doable. It, it, it's done all the time. And uh, the AC coupled, the DC coupled system, back up one, the DC coupled system was the original most popular uh, grid connected battery backup system. But now with the power walls and other fancy configurations, plus the fact that a lot of people who install direct grid connect systems who now decide they want, to, uh, they, they didn't realize they wouldn't have power after a storm took out the utility. They, they want that power. So all you have to do is add the red, the orange, the brown, the green, and the purple to your existing grid connected system. And then you've got the battery backup for emergency power, or let's call it standby power. Uh, only the local authority having jurisdiction can decide whether you're allowed to use that for, for emergency power. So anyway, so we have two different kinds of systems. The one that's most commonly installed from uh, what I hear from my friends out there it now are the AC coupled systems, but they've made some improvements on the DC coupled systems as well, so they have fewer components. So, uh, and, and there's not as much back and forth between AC and DC, so they can't be ruled out either. Advantage of the AC coupled system though is the direct grid connected inverters, they're typically now 98% efficient. So between array and standby loads, you lose only about 2%, maybe three if you allow for uh, wiring losses. So it's more efficient in getting power to standby loads. Okay, so I scale it up, everything, the inverters, the arrays, the storage, and you've got utility scale, uh, renewable energy. That's nice and clean. And, and there's other things that might be included with this and uh, like smaller energy s storage localized or maybe uh, using electric vehicles and smart garages to store energy or maybe even uh, microgrids which are uh, instead of just a battery backup house it'll be a battery, ba battery backup neighborhood with a single connection into the utility. All right so we're going to be looking at now just we now have evidence that battery backup systems can be made very reliably. The technology can be scaled up. And so that's what we're going to be looking at now is basically scaled up systems. Let me look here and make sure that anybody, uh, uh, all right, we got 14 folks now, 16 participants counting me. And I don't see any questions up. Okay. Okay. I'm going to check every once in a while. And there may be times when I will find the participant. Oh, here's a question. Okay, let's see what we got here. 
Okay, any how much cost to add to the system to include the red, green, purple, and brown options? Um, it, uh, it It's hard to say exactly because it depends on what particular technology you use in the red, green, and brown, and purples, but uh, we had some family members up on Long Island who have been looking into uh, uh, after that big storm back in August that knocked out power for, I don't know, what was it, five days or so? Uh, they started asking those questions and it looks like it just about more or less doubles the cost uh, and it depends partly on how many batteries you install. Uh, if you want enough batteries to save store one day's worth of electricity or if you want two days worth of electricity it's going to cost twice as much for the batteries. Uh, and, and, and oh yes I'm so glad Nicholas that you mentioned that because uh, uh, I mean I happen to be a proud owner of a uh, plug-in hybrid uh, electric vehicle and I love talking about electric vehicles the answer is yes we're going to talk about power walls a little bit later on and, we'll go, and, and electric vehicles do present an opportunity for major, major, major storage. Uh, let's see, let's go back to, okay, the, for Robert Pohl, uh, I'm just gonna say order uh, roughly twice as, doubles the price. Uh, in terms of doing the economics on it, you have to consider the storage as an insurance policy. However, it's changing. It's not just an insurance policy anymore because if you have allowed the utility control to control your storage, such that if the utility needs additional power during utility peak times and the utility can talk to your storage and say, can you give me 5,000 watts for an hour? And your storage might say, yeah, I can do that, but it's gonna cost you 22 cents a kilowatt hour or 30 cents a kilowatt hour and then they negotiate, okay? So that's new, that's, that's gonna be coming down the road within the next five years, there are experimental systems out there now. Okay, let's go back to Nicholas, uh, where yes, we're gonna talk about EVs and firewalls. James, let's see, what's the software required in control between local and network? Uh, oh, how vulnerable, the, the, the communication doesn't necessarily have to, well, okay, the control between the utility and the consumer, uh, anything that's out on, in, on the internet or is even power line carrier uh, is probably vulnerable to hacking. And, and, and that, of course, makes work for people to try to make sure it's, it's not very likely. And, and of course, I'm at risk with my electric car just because I can uh, uh, check on my, uh, with my, my uh, cell phone to see how much it's charged when it's plugged in. So, but very important consideration and what we're talking about here is what's it gonna to take to make sure that we can reach this. And, and I'm gonna ignore the whole idea of going to 80% because I've done the math and I can see that we could be at 100% renewable by 2035. And, and so, uh, uh, but this was back in 2012 when NREL didn't realize how fast technology was moving when they were shooting for, for 90% by 2050. Okay, so yeah, it, there's some vulnerability. And uh, so that's basically the same vulnerability that the computers are using right now are to somebody hacking in and starting to type uh, things all over our screens that we might not wanna be having to, uh, to read. So let's see, Nick, uh, interested in learning about this concept. Uh, yeah, okay. In fact, we, uh, there's another, it's called Electric Trends that talks with a lot about electric vehicles. And so um, uh, check the webinar schedule because we can spend two hours on that if you want. We, we will do as much as we can in this two hour period without skipping over too many other things. But uh, I'm happy to know you're interested because it's one of my favorite topics, in fact. Okay, I'm gonna click off the questions and move along here. Um, so, okay. Um, why is energy storage important? Well, it should be kind of obvious, but there are more, uh, one of the main reasons is, uh, you know, 
pretty obvious the sun doesn't shine at night. And so if you want photovoltaic to be your 24 hour, 24 seven power source, obviously you have to save some of that daytime energy for use at night, okay? And there's some even more challenging situations if you live like north of the Arctic Circle, you don't get a whole lot of photovoltaic energy at all in the, in the winter time or south of the Antarctic Circle. So um, there, there are times when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow and uh, it's necessary to cover for that if you want all renewables. The, the answer is to make more than you need when you can and save it so you've got it when you need it. There's some other sources as well, and we're going to talk about some of those uh, other options. Um, and, and see, when you've got energy storage, we, they've been doing large-scale energy storage since way, way, way before large wind machines and photovoltaic systems. Uh, the, the original large thermal store sources, and if you're up in the Massachusetts area and drive along Highway 2 along the north end of the state, there's about six large... Uh, pumped hydro storage that when the nuclears were being built in the 1950s, they were finding that they were capable of delivering more than what the base load required. So they simply decided to pump water uphill with the excess capacity so they wouldn't have to throttle them down since they're inherently unstable. Makes it, uh, you have to be really careful in terms of controlling them, uh, inserting the control rods and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so uh, they've been around for a long time. So that means that not only can the uh, renewables benefit, but the nukes can benefit and any other large thermal sources can benefit from having energy storage to, to uh, just level things out. Uh, <clears throat> Y'all probably, I, I, my guess is maybe half of the people in, uh, on this uh, uh, online right now maybe have in their garage a uh, small gasoline generator of some sort, or maybe even a whole house generator. Um, and you know, you crank up this 5,000 watt generator and plug in a 100 watt light bulb, or well, who buys 100 watt light bulbs anymore? Say a seven watt light bulb uh, that gives out 100 watts worth of light. And uh, Okay, a couple more questions. We'll get to them in just a minute. Uh, so, whoops, I lost my thought. Oh, oh, the, the thing is, the rotating thermal sources, uh, they've got inertia that keeps them spinning at the 1800 or 3600 RPMs to give you the 60 hertz electricity. So that when you switch on a second light bulb or a second dryer or water heater or something, uh, as long as you don't exceed the rating of the generator, it will follow that load. Okay. So on the other hand, if you have solar system, there's no fuel cost. So you want to be able to take that extra solar power that's not being used right now you don't want to just throttle it down and say, okay, you can, you can take a rest now. Uh, you want to capture that sun and you want to save it somewhere so that when it's needed by the grid, it's available. Okay, if variable sources produce XX energy, then you've got a choice, curtail it or protect, and, and you have to curtail it, otherwise it would try to run the, the rotating generators backwards or you have to store it so that it can be used when it's needed. And to some extent, storage is like curtailment. The only difference is, well, curtailment, it's energy you don't get back again. Storage, you'll get back maybe at least somewhere in the 80%, 80 to 90%, depending on your storage mechanism. Okay, so it's a matter of, do you want to get part of the energy back that's available, or do you want to just want to not generate it in the first place? And then the uh, we're at a point in time now where introducing storage is becoming the economically most attractive choice. Okay, here's one, let, let's amplify that comment I just made a little bit. Uh, storage technologies are advancing like crazy, uh, for one thing, and uh, fossil fuel prices, they're kind of volatile. 
um, the energy markets have been deregulated. So uh, there's competition for making the cheapest electricity. Uh, and if storage can help that, then uh, uh, the deregulation gives people a chance to get more creative. Uh, and then there's the high value ancillary service that are involved with storage, uh, the computing, the, the measuring, the controlling and so forth. Um, and the challenge is deciding if you have new transmission and distribution, because if you got a lot of uh, uh, photovoltaics out in the deserts out west, a lot of that electricity could be used in the Midwest and the East if we had more east-west transmission lines, and uh, there just aren't that many. So people are starting to do some cost analysis on whether it makes sense to uh, string some more transmission lines east-west, just to take advantage of uh, uh, noontime electricity in California or, 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 or Nevada uh, at three o'clock in uh, North Carolina or New York or someplace like that. Okay. The levelized cost of energy for wind and photovoltaic are both decreasing rapidly. And in fact, right now, it is cheaper to make electricity with wind or photovoltaics than with natural gas. And if you start throwing in environmental considerations, then they beat coal and they beat everything. And, and believe me, the utilities wouldn't be building many hundreds of megawatts of renewables in wind and solar if it didn't make sense economically. And that is something that's only since about 2017, depending on where you live, uh, depending on what your utility rate is, because it was a whole lot easier for the utility for, for, for wind and solar to beat the price of electricity in New England than it was in Florida. But Right now, we're looking at levelized cost of energy in the neighborhood of six cents a kilowatt hour for wind or solar, and that, that's pretty cheap electricity. And that's talking over the total lifetime of the system in order to pay back your initial investment in that system, you're going to have to charge about six cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, and uh, I, I don't know, it all depends on who you're listening to, but some people actually believe that carbon dioxide from thermal sources causes global climate change. And if that's of an issue with you, and I will confess that it's a big time issue with me because I've done the math, uh, which is one of the curses we all as engineers have. We have the ability to do the math oftentimes. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, carbon dioxide, we've got to find another way. And uh, that, of course, helps drive the market for the renewables. Uh, we need to make the distinction between power and energy in storage, OK? Uh, most storage mechanisms, let's just say every storage mechanism, because I think second law of thermodynamics would require that, there is some losses between putting energy in and taking energy out. Okay, and because of internal resistance, the power loss in internal resistance of a device is proportional to the square of the current being delivered to or taken from the device, I squared our losses. And that is the only thing that's good for is heating the battery or heating the room. And uh, down here in Florida, we have no need to heat the room these days. So it mostly heats the battery and uh, so when you want more power out of a storage mechanism, then you get less energy out of it because more energy gets dissipated in the device itself on the way out. So that's something that we need to then make a distinction of how many watts do we need to be able to get from this photovoltaic storage device? And how many kilowatt hours do we need to get out of this storage device? So kilowatt hours and watts are all, or megawatts or gigawatts, they're, they're both important. So we're gonna be looking at both energy storage classification and power storage classification as capacity. And the, the simplest example is your automobile battery. 
that is capacity. It has to have enough capacity to turn that starter motor. Once the starter motor is started, your battery is used for very little. And uh, you've got an alternator that keeps it charged. But you need a, a high power initially to get the thing started and then almost no demand on it. On the other hand, energy is something like in a system that you want to run your refrigerator in your house all day long. That means that energy has to come out at a relatively lower rate in order to last for that long. Sorry about the phone. Let's see if I can turn it off. Yep. Okay. Um, so we need to consider energy and capacity, and we'll be looking at that as we move through here. Um, There's some storage uh, sources that do a pretty good job on both. Others, uh, they're strictly for energy or strictly for capacity. And most of the lead acid are either the uh, deep discharge, meaning energy storage, or shallow discharge, meaning uh, starter capacity. Uh, but uh, a lot of the lithium can, technologies can uh, do a pretty good job on providing power and energy. Um, this simply means it has low, have low internal, low equivalent internal resistance, okay? Um, here's an example of that for lead acid. If you discharge it faster, you don't get as many ampere hours out of it. If you discharge it slower, you get more ampere hours out. And this works in the other way around as well. Uh, if you charge it slowly, uh, then it takes less kilowatt hours to fill the battery than if you try to charge it quickly. And that, that is an important consideration with electric vehicles. Uh, the faster you discharge it and the faster you recharge it, the less you get out of the batteries. Um, we, we have, uh, <laughs> certain advantages to being an electrical engineer. That would be, it became very evident we bought when we bought our electric. And uh, it was rated at 48 miles uh, electricity only when we bought it. And now it is uh, smart, it learns. And we know to watch the gauge and don't discharge too fast by flooring it, even though it's fun to kind of do that and show these hot Dodge chargers or whatever, that uh, they're not the only car on the road. But then again, I'm 77 years old and I'm not allowed to do that anymore. I guess I really never did that. Uh, too much editorializing here. Uh, so so uh, this is an interesting question. When you get into the level of charging, level two charger actually is a little bit less efficient than level one charging, even though level one charging takes a lot longer to get the batteries charged up. So interesting uh, results and the, the, all these little bits of pieces of physics are, are useful when you're trying to squeeze the last drop out of your system. So here's some examples. If you want power quality and regulation, like in trench instability, if you lose a generator, you don't want to lose your system. So you want to be able to keep that frequency regulated. Maybe you need a reactive power. It only takes up to a few minutes of backup in order to keep the grid stable until you can get something else fired up. Uh, maybe you're switching from one source to another source and you have a contingency reserve that takes a little while to fire up to full capacity. So then you're gonna want to be able to deliver power from your storage mechanism in the minutes to an hour range. And then there's this energy management part that says, well, you know, sun doesn't shine at night. And so we need to store energy. And so this is where we start talking about being able to store, uh, store this energy for periods of hours. All right, so just so you know that these are classes used regardless of the type of energy storage being used, whether it's pumped hydro or whatever. And we're gonna look at the various sources here very soon. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's an interesting example of energy and power. This, uh, in 1997, South Australia was having some problems with grid stability with all those windmills. 
And Elon Musk said, we can help. And here's the deal. We will build you a 100 megawatt storage facility in 100 days. And if we can't do it in 100 days, you get it for free. Now, how can you turn down a deal like that? So, uh, uh, indeed, uh, they built it in less than 100 days. Like, can you imagine a facility that size? Look at the windmills in perspective. Being building something like that in 100 days? There's some places where you can't get a permit to install a photovoltaic system on a roof in 100 days. So just thinking about the administrative part of it, forget about the construction part. So that was really quite a feat to build that thing, that, that, that big battery. It's just big, big, basically big. You can see these uh, uh, smaller units piled end and end to end, and those are, uh, you know, lithium battery things. And not too long after this thing was installed, uh, a coal-fired plant tripped off the grid, and it took 140 milliseconds for this thing to crank up to 100 megawatts to back up that coal-fired plant. The thing has 129 megawatt hour capacity, so what does that mean? It can deliver 100 megawatts, that's it, that's the power, maximum power output allowed. But it can do that for 1.29 hours. All right, and that gives you 129 megawatt hours. So this is a pretty nice big battery they've got over there in Australia. And if you want to read about it, here's some references, and they'll be on the slides if you order up the slides. Okay, here's some test results for that battery, and you can see that uh, <coughs> uh, when, when it's negative, the red thing, that's where the battery is charging from the grid. And then when we go positive on the output, uh, 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 that means that uh, the battery is adding to the generation and trying to maintain relatively level power output. Okay, and this was on uh, December 1st, 2017, that uh, they measured this profile. So, uh, and again, here's the reference if you want to read more on it. There were other pro battery projects going on in 2017 as well. San Diego Gas and Electric had a 150 megawatt hour lithium ion technology plant uh, in the books and uh, Southern Cal Edison, 80 megawatt hours and 30 megawatts. And uh, again, you can read these things, the Chinese, Japanese, the, I don't know how many times I hear people say, why does the United States have to do it all? It's the, 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 the Chinese and India and every place else is doing all this pollution. Well, uh, folks, uh, China's way ahead of us in, in, in the uh, installation of windmills and portable pigs. And, and if we could keep up with them, we'd be doing just fine. They, they are not waiting for us at all. They are taking the lead. So uh, just keep in mind that the United States is not take, is a world leader in deployment of either wind, solar, or storage technology. It is happening elsewhere. And we have a ways to go to catch up. All right. This distributed virtual power plant is an interesting thing. It's here's a thousand batteries there system. This is, uh, you know, you talk about distributed uh, generation where you've got a solar system on everybody's roof in the neighborhood so that at some point the sun is always shining on somebody's solar system while the other one might be under clouds. and the, that's a good way of smoothing out the output by having a lot of them all over the place because it's not always cloudy everywhere. Um, so in any case, uh, you can see some of the technologies there on the batteries, lithium ions, vanadium flow, and sulfur flow batteries. The flow batteries are interesting because the energy is actually stored in the electrolyte rather than in the electrodes, where, which is the case for lead and lithium and so forth. So, Battery technology is going like crazy. Here's a reference for you. Uh, there's some very interesting situations when you've got a source that doesn't require any fuel, like wind or solar, and you've got another source that requires fuel, like natural gas or, or coal or something that's fossil. Because once you got the PV or the wind built, then you want to crank out as much energy as possible because there's no fuel cost. Whereas, uh, so, so you, you don't want to have to curtail those sources because you're throwing money away if you curtail them. 
But when the wind and the solar provide energy to the grid, then the thermal sources use less fuel and then they produce less energy and they produce it less efficiency because, because the thermal sources are more efficient when they're running up somewhere close to 90% of load. And so that's interesting that, the, and, and of course, it's the kilowatt hours that they sell. The peaking generators, they sell kilowatts and they get paid for those kilowatts. Otherwise they wouldn't bother to make them in the first place, but they pay a whole lot more, maybe 30, 40, 50 cents a kilowatt hour to have that available in an instant when it's needed. Okay, so uh, it's an interesting consideration. And clearly you wanna use as much energy you can from the wind and from the solar. But if you're gonna keep the thermal sources, then the only way they pay for themselves is by operating and, 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 and selling their kilowatts and their kilowatt hours. So one day we may not have this problem anymore because the thermal sources might be just replaced by energy storage instead. Uh, I may not be around for that, but uh, look 15, 20 years down the line and, and those of you who plan to be here in 2040, you're gonna see a whole lot of replacement of thermal sources with wind photovoltaics and storage. Uh, so here we just said that. So, all right, we already made that argument. So one interesting thing you can do is if you decommission inefficient thermal and then use that space for a big storage facility, uh, it just may be a better investment for the future. Uh, variable source behavior example is uh, kind of useful to look at. Uh, the load itself is green and the wind is, the red is what the wind is capable of doing and doing over a period of about 160 hours here. And you notice the blue then is the net load. So if you subtract the red from the green, you get blue. Okay, and uh, Notice the slopes, those are the interesting things because that ramping, that's turning on fast, turning off fast if it's sloped down, turning off fast, sloping, turning on fast if it slopes up. And, and look at right around 60 hours there, 50 hours, where the wind is pretty steady, pretty strong, and it takes up a fairly significant part of the net load, or of the load, but look at the ramp then that has to be made up by the rest of the system in order to meet the needs of the green, the load. So these steep ramps are, all right, at least we know about it. So uh, you, you can't fix something unless you know it's broke. And again, this is where storage comes in really, really handy to be able to fill in some of these, help help to level off some of these slopes. And that's why we're talking about huge storage. Okay, or uh, if nothing else, very, very broadly uh, diversified storage. Back in 2012, 2011, this is what was out there. Lithium ions, uh, VR, I forgot what VR. Um, nickel metal highlight, high, 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 high uh, sodium sulfide batteries, uh, compressed air energy storage. Uh, and notice what happened to the orange one, the lithium ion storage, and, and what's the vertical scale? That's discharge time, okay? And the horizontal scale is the rated megawatts. And you notice as the rated megawatts as you pull more megawatts out, your discharge time goes down and it's almost a linear relationship there. Uh, to get one megawatt, you get a 10th of an hour of uh, discharge time. To get uh, a 10th of a megawatt, then you get an hour of discharge time. And if you want a hundredth of a megawatt, then you get 10 hours of discharge time for the same battery pack. And basically says you've got that many uh, in this particular case, uh, one hour and a discharge uh, 
uh, let's say of, of a tenth of a megawatt, that would be 100 uh, kilowatt hours of storage. All right, well, in any case, we're looking at a comparison of where, where uh, technology has gone from lithium in the 2011, 2010 timeframe up to 2017, that system though in Australia. And look at that orange dot over there at 100 megawatts, which is 100 times bigger than was available back in the 2010 timeframe. And a discharge time of an hour, and that's actually 1.29 hours, we already know that. And in 1.29 hours, uh, the lithium ion technologies, the best they could do back then was about 0.2 megawatts. We're looking at logarithmic scales here, okay? So uh, here's what all these things are. VR is vanadium redox flow batteries, zinc bromide flow batteries, again, if you and, and uh, if you really want to get into this and, and quit watching TV at night, uh, order the slides and uh, you can look at them on your computer and just just for a break. Okay, uh, round trip efficiency. We've hinted at that uh, because with uh, you have some systems the storage is DC storage, and some systems have AC storage. So in order to compare apples to apples, you have to talk you have to compare AC in to AC out. So therefore, if you got AC coming into batteries, you first have to rectify it to DC. And then when you pull it back out again, you have to invert it back to AC. And there's losses in each process. All right, so if we acknowledge that and the AC to AC round trip efficiency, then what do we get? Um, for batteries, somewhere between 70 and 90%, depending on the technology. Pumped hydro, somewhere 80, 70 to 80%. That's just pumping water uphill and then letting it run back downhill again. So we're looking at a pretty efficient motor to pump, uh, for a pretty efficient pumping to uh, achieve 80% on that. Uh, by the, 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 the asterisk is, uh, means that this information has come from a different source, which we'll see at the end here. Uh, compressed air storage, flywheels, and uh, this is from the Inter Interstate Renewable Energy Council uh, data on these uh, various storage things. If you want to read some really good reports, uh, go to the IREC website and download some of their reports. They've got some really good stuff that they've done. Uh, there are a lot of other good labs out there that have done some interesting things. Uh, things like Florida Solar Energy Center, things like uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute and so forth. Uh, fantastic research work these folks are doing and development work on, on renewables. Uh, let's see, any, oh, there are a couple questions. Let's look at the Q&A. Sorry, I missed that. <coughs> um, oh, okay, okay. Um, we've answered all these live and they're done. So let's take those off. Okay, now we can see. Yeah, okay, Nick has a gas portable generator. So I think he probably uh, agreed that uh, the com comment on the gas portable generator, we certainly have a lot of them around here in South Florida in hurricane territory. So uh, let's see, we've got a live answer there and we got a live answer on that. And so we're done on these two. All right, now we'll be able to find questions easier. Okay, so round trip efficiency, uh, flywheels, 60 to 80%. That's kind of interesting, isn't it, flywheel? You would think when you have a flywheel <coughs> rotating and storing megawatt hours, that to get those megawatt hours out, you'd have to slow that flywheel down as you're taking the energy out, this half I omega squared type, type stuff. And if you slow the flywheel down, isn't that gonna slow down the frequency of the electricity generated? And the answer is no, not really, because what you do is you put an inverter and you convert the output of the flywheel to DC and run it into an inverter. 
And then no matter how fast the flywheel is moving, the inverter is still going to give you 60 hertz electricity, and probably in this case, three phase at, at uh, who knows what voltage, maybe at uh, distribution level. All right, so uh, uh, all these things, we're talking about AC to AC, but in order to maintain for some of these things, uh, make sure you maintain frequency, <clears throat> the AC conversion, DC to AC conversion is uh, with an inverter to make sure that you get a good 60 hertz source with a good sine wave. Okay, pumping water uphill. Gosh, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Uh, you got extra power, you pump the water up to the reservoir. When you need some power, you reverse the direction. It takes about a half hour, okay? Um, initially, you would pump the water uphill during the day, or at night, I mean, when you had extra, and then use it during the day, but now, there's a good chance you'll have excess electricity during the day from your PV. So pump some water uphill and then use it at night to make electricity. All right. And then these are big stations, you know, 50, 100 megawatts. Not that uh, yeah, we'll see some sizes here. Uh, and then prices and, you know, $1,000 a kilo, $800 per kilowatt. That, that, that's, that's reasonable price. Uh, on the other hand, it takes a long time to build these things. Permitting is a nightmare. And uh, so even though the uh, had reasonable round trip efficiency and the newer plants are up somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% or better, uh, and there's a lot of places where you can have these, <clears throat> um, they're not building quite as many now, but there are a lot of them already there. Question. Let's see what we got. Okay, your company made a machine that previously used two big cat diesel engines with a design. Uh-huh. Okay, and, and I'm sure you understand why you did that, right, James? Uh, because that means when you're not, that means you can keep these diesel machines running near full power so that you store that excess energy in a flywheel and then you don't have to run it at, at low power where it's less efficient. And so you don't have to run it at full power. You can actually use a smaller flywheel. And that's one of the advantages of, of uh, storage. It levels the load. So that, that's a great example. I appreciate you sharing that. All right, so pretty obvious where, where you, you need hills. And you'll see up there in the uh, Massachusetts along Highway 2 there where there's uh, quite a few of uh, operating uh, pumped hydro plants. You can't see them from the road. I, I drove the whole length of it and didn't realize they were there until a few days later when I found out about it, so interesting. Um, Who's got the stored hydro? Well, the United States got 19%. Japan's got 19%. They're a little bit smaller than we are. China's got 27%, 35% in the rest of the world. So the United States is not exactly the leader in pumped hydro, is it? These are the big plants too, bigger than uh, a thousand, essentially bigger than a thousand megawatts, okay? There's a lot of smaller ones around as well. But still, um, we got to be careful when we talk about uh, the Chinese not uh, doing things that are planning for the future because they are certainly doing a whole lot more than we are right now. But they learned the hard way. Well, we did too, but we learned about 50 years sooner when Philadelphia was uh, just covered with, uh, and Pittsburgh was covered with, with, with carbon from smoke and they decided it was time to clean it up. And the Chinese had an experience when they tried to run the Olympics and some of the athletes really didn't want to go. They were concerned. You can see the comparison here between compressed air energy storage and pumped hydro. Uh, there's not a whole lot of compressed air out there, 
But one nice thing about it is you're storing your energy underground, so your footprint, uh, the number of acres it takes per megawatt hour of storage is a lot smaller for uh, compressed air than for pumped hydro, uh, provided you can find a place that has a good place to store the compressed air. Um, here's some pump storage hydro plants. <clears throat> Again, just a list of uh, what was going on up through 2016 <clears throat> to add to some of the information that was in this 2012 study. Um, again, yeah, I, I'm, we're not going to read this whole thing. You can read that. Uh, it's, this is what you'd like to read about. Uh, your obligation is to sit through without falling asleep for two hours here, and hopefully we can achieve that. But there's more here to be learned than meets the eye in two hours if you feel like you want to order up the slides and look at them again. Okay, uh, pump storage hydro, where can it be? Well, again, the obvious places where there's big hills, okay? And so uh, it's interesting to know, and REDS is Regional Energy Deployment System. Um, what about compressed air? <clears throat> well, here's the way you do it. Not, not too surprising. When you compress air, uh, there's a lot of heat generated. When you expand it, it absorbs heat. So you've got some heat exchangers that uh, take into account the fact that compressing and expanding either, well, I mean, let's face it, it's like an air conditioner with a refrigerant. When you compress it, you squeeze out the heat and expand it and you absorb more heat. Um, this large volume, this large cavern, you know, it's underground though. And if nobody's there, and if, uh, maybe if it's the, the land above it, it's gonna collapse unless you pressurize it. Uh, maybe with the fracking that's been going on, maybe that's a good thing to do to fill up some of those spaces if they're limestone caverns, fill them up with air. Who knows, again, this is, we're talking conceptual stuff. We're talking about what pretty much everything we're talking about here has been commercialized. That means that they are cost effective uh, in the minds of those who do the, do the math on them. So uh, there are a lot of places. Uh, and again, going from uh, storing to uh, re retrieving is about a 30 minute turnaround time. So that's not too bad. Uh, it's better than gas turbines for the ramping rate. Um, here's some criteria. If you want to store air underground, pretty obvious stuff. And here's places where you can store it. And porous rock, there's a lot of that around. And bedded salt, my goodness, even Florida is a candidate for compressed air energy storage. So now if we look at uh, storage caverns, okay, again, you can read this. I'm going to skip over it. Uh, and here's some costs for compressed air, okay, in a salt cavern. You need basically seven major components. And we're looking at something like $774 a kilowatt, which is relatively comparable to the cost of, of pumped hydro, difference being not as much real estate used. And so it is becoming a little more attractive, although it's interesting to see what's going on underground. It's easier to see what's going on above ground than what's underground. Question here, doesn't Florida have a lot of karst formations Leak spots, and oh my God, do we ever. Yeah, yeah, that's why uh, that, the white part on that map, I live on, in, in the southeast Florida where the white is. And, and yes, there, we, we can't build a, a dike here because as you say, the, the, as the sea level rises, the salt water from the sea, we have salt water intrusion. And even since I moved down 50 years ago, they've had to move freshwater wells to the west in order to keep the salt water out. So you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and so there's still some places in Florida, you can't store it everywhere. Yeah, okay, you were in Tampa. Uh, I'm not sure what's over there. 
we'd have to look at the map a little more closely, I guess. I'm just clicking here. Okay. Oops, here's another question. When you're hearing my point, you mean you understand what I'm saying, you mean? Okay. Here we go then. Uh, again, just what the... Uh, got it. Okay. <clears throat> cost, just it's interesting to compare the cost of the various mechanisms, okay? Uh, what's out there? What's coming up? Flywheels, they are actually commercially available now as uh, somebody pointed out, flywheel with a diesel engine saved a bunch of money. Um, capacitors are extremely fast for transient voltage stability. They're very close to being uh, uh, commercially uh, available, but they're still a little bit expensive. Um, you know, anything that's got a half I omega squared, a half CB squared, a half I, a half LI squared, uh, you know, you're talking about rotational velocity, you're talking about uh, voltage, uh, you're talking about current. And there are lots of different means of storage. They call flywheel capacitor magnets. There was another question here. Let's see what we got from Robert. Let's see, the United States permitting process discourages building pump storage. Uh, permitting is always an issue. Uh, you can almost, I mean, this, the, the, the prices that they give this uh, levelized cost of energy of six cents a kilowatt hour includes the land cost. All right, they include all the costs, including decommissioning <clears throat> over the life of the system. So, and, and you can actually ask Google how many square miles of uh, area does it need to generate all the kilowatt hours needed by the United States. And, I forget what it is. I think it's maybe an area of 100 by 100, not even 100 by 100 miles, I don't think. And when I look around right now, <clears throat> renewables are generating <clears throat> somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of all of the electricity. <clears throat> oh dear, oh, go away. Um, and when you look around you at all the rooftops that are available, all we need to do is start designing rooftops that are more conducive to collecting solar. I mean, uh, I've been trying to convince architects that for years. That, uh, my goodness, design a simpler south-facing roof and you can collect lots of electricity. Somebody will love you for it in 2020. I was preaching that back in 2010. In fact, I was wrong. They would have loved them for it in 2017. So uh, it, it's a good point. And, and, and if you do the math though, that's the thing. If you do the math, uh, there is still space for them. And when you think of what the alternatives are, all of a sudden with no pollution at all, the, it becomes very, 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 very uh, positive. Even think about things like parking lots where you can have parking canopies and uh, the advantages of being able to park your car in a uh, sheltered area. So again, excellent point. And uh, I, I appreciate the uh, participation. Uh, and I think we're still gonna make it through. Uh, magnets, uh, what else have we got? Um, high power batteries, the big ones. Uh, and here we go, electric vehicles. Typical electric vehicle, and, and you know, the big, the, 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 the big Teslas will hold 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, but if you have 10, 50 kilowatt hours of storage in your electric vehicle and you get four miles per kilowatt hour, which is about what we get, that, that's 200 mile range. And so delivering five kilowatts in a couple of kilowatt hours 
say even five kilowatt hours, this is a pretty small fraction of the total charge. And especially if you can buy it back again at night for 10 cents a kilowatt hour and sell it during the day for 25 cents a kilowatt hour, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, whatever the market might bear, all of a sudden electric vehicles in very large numbers, like hundreds of millions. And again, this is that other webinar I was telling you about uh, uh, earlier where we, we look at all these numbers and see what an incredibly fantastic opportunity for storing energy when an electric vehicle is parked at a smart charging station that is bi-directional and where you can sell electricity back to the utility when they need it. So electric vehicles in another 10 years will be an incredible resource for energy storage. And the hydrogen thing has been going around and around and around for years and years, and there's still things to overcome, but no, the people are not giving up on hydrogen. And there's one missing here, uh, weightlifting, okay? Forget about just lifting water uphill. You can imagine, let's say, six cranes that are 200 feet high, each of which is capable of lifting weights that weigh, say, a ton and stacking them and then pick and, and, and in the process of stacking these weights, these are electric driven cranes that take electricity from the grid and pile up weights. Okay. These are, they've got some commercial systems like this in operation in Europe already, by the way. And then when the utility needs some electricity, the crane grabs one of these big ton weights and lets it drop to the ground again and recovers all that potential energy that was stored in it, not all of it, but enough of it with uh, roughly 75 to 80% round trip efficiency and probably will improve to better than that. Uh, but it certainly ought to be at least as good as pumped hydro. Okay, so, uh, and then there's another one is thermal storage that is not on this list, but uh, you can store hot sodium, for example, uh, and let that make steam to make electricity at night if you do that with a concentrating solar system. And they are doing this out in the uh, California desert areas and have been doing it for a while. Uh, I'm not gonna read this. I'm just gonna tell you if you wanna read it, order the slides, okay? Because it's just the, gives an idea of what the levelized cost of storage is for a lot of different storages under a lot of different conditions. And we could spend all day reading just one of these. But there's more than one. Lithium is getting a lot of good press these days. And uh, I'm just including this slide for six different lithium technologies. There's not just one, there's six of them. And you can kind of imagine the cost of them. Cell phones, laptops, and cameras are where you want really high energy density, low weight those cute little batteries that you don't want uh, weighing things down too much. <clears throat> so the lithium cobalt oxide is great for those kinds of things. Then your electric grill is probably going to use lithium manganese oxide. And the LIP, the lithium iron phosphate, or the LFP I mean, is very popular also in power tools and electric vehicles and medical and, and it's the lithium iron phosphate is probably the most common uh, EV. But now we hear that uh, Elon Musk has just announced in two years, they're gonna have a much, much better lithium technology. And uh, well, I guess in two years or three years, we'll find out what that's gonna be. So anyway, just again, some information for you in case you're interested, okay? Uh, and, and wow, you know, Somebody once told me to never make busy slides like this. But again, the reason for this is so you can have it all in one chart. And if you wanna have an idea what the specifications are for various technologies, and then, then here's all of them in one, one, one location for you to check out. Okay, another question. Typical use of life of a lithium battery. You know what? I'm not sure anybody really knows. Uh, you may have heard of the Tesla experiment where they've driven the Tesla cars over 500,000 miles on a, on a battery pack. 
Uh, and, you know, it's hard to determine uh, useful life is sometimes measured in the number of cycles, but then again, if you don't go from 100% to 0%, if you go from, say, 80 to 50 and back to 80 and 50 back and forth, you can get more cycles like that. But uh, useful life of a lithium battery, uh, I'm pretty sure I've got lithium batteries in my hybrid that I just uh, it was 10 years old, and uh, those uh, lithium batteries were still functioning fine after 10 years. So I think 10 years as a minimum expectation is okay. Uh, but I think the answer is they are so relatively new in terms of deploying in large capacities that nobody really quite knows exactly how long they're going to last. Disposal, presumably recycling, but they said we we're going to recycle all the plastic too, didn't they? And uh, that hasn't quite happened. So again, we're going to have to watch that one and see where it leads us. All right. Again, really good question today. I'm impressed, folks. Michael, uh, nicely done. Uh, uh, I don't know about all, well, you know, I, I spent 36 years at a university uh, teaching electrical engineering and doing a little research on uh, uh, some silicon technologies. But uh, when you get good questions from your students, that, that's what makes you feel really good. It makes feels like uh, it was worth being here today. So uh, again, let me say thanks for all the good questions. Much appreciated. Um, Here's what's happening in time in terms of energy density. Obviously, what do you want is a small volume, low weight, and lots of megawatt hours stored in that small volume and small weight. And, and this is where the world is headed for things like capacitors, flywheels, and different chemical batteries like lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hyride, lithium ion, lithium polymer. So, Amazing progress is being made in storage. Look at that watt hours per kilogram chart there. Uh, it, it, it's uh, really going up in a hurry. Okay, so here's your Tesla battery out here. This, remember, this chart you're looking at was uh, up through 2008. Cohen McGee drew this up in 2008. So look where Tesla was in 2017 in terms of uh, energy per unit cost. Uh, right on. Okay, so if we want 80% renewables for 2050, did I, did I say 90%? Well, 80, okay. But uh, like I say, uh, folks have rethought and it's easy to do the math to show that we can go 100% by 2035 if we have the political will to do that. Uh, but that's another story in another, another webinar. But here's some of the possible scenarios, okay? <clears throat> there's a scenario called constrained flexibility, which means that there's a lot of institutional constraints on, on here, here's your question about uh, permitting wind and, and solar, okay? Uh, so if there are a lot of in institutional constraints on deployment of wind and, and, and solar, then it's going to take more, we'll see what, the, the, what, what that's going to result in, the amount of storage will, that will be needed. Then there's the no technology improvement. In other words, uh, we're not going to improve batteries or anything. We're just going to go with what we already have, but we're going to use more wind. And then there's the high demand, 80% renewables, wind and, and, and solar. And then there's the constrained resources model that institutional constraints might reduce development or something else might happen to constrain things or transmission lines. Uh, and, and everybody knows it's not easy to permit a transmission line, but uh, if you can build them in the right places where everybody's happy, you can come up with more efficient system and more reliable system. Then there's the incremental technology improvement scenario that says, okay, uh, we're going to slowly improve batteries and slowly improve this and that. And then there's the evolutionary technology improvement that says, we're going to throw out all this old stuff that's expensive and doesn't work very well and invent a bunch of, old, bunch of newer stuff. Now, 
I'll let you decide for yourself which of these technologies were more, or scenarios were more likely to adopt, but here is what effect that has on the amount of storage we're going to need. And you see that from the top one, where it's constrained flexibility, we're going to need 50% more gigawatts capacity storage than if we go into this evolutionary technology scenario at the bottom. So again, do the math. Uh, it makes pretty good sense. And, 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 and yeah, use your imagination. We, we, we live in a world where people like to do things that are most cost effective. And uh, my guess is we are going to be very close to the ETI situation. And certainly in the last eight years, it's been less 30, 40 years has been evolutionary technological improvements. So the question, are we going to go less than 100 gigawatts? Who knows? Maybe not. But in any case, the point being, uh, when we relieve some of the constraints but protect the environment, uh, we can get by with less storage, which to some extent protects the environment as well, especially if we're using pumped hydro, which is hard to permit. The less storage we need to install, the less we have to permit, and probably the more likely we can get it in easily. Here, Here's a possibility scenario for development, okay? What time is it, by the way? Are we gonna keep anybody late for dinner? 3.34, we're doing okay. Uh, look in the 2020 to 2030 time frame here. And projection is that there's gonna be a whole lot of storage built here in the near future. Investments in the neighborhood of $11.1 .1 billion a year. Well, how, do, well how, how, how much does that compare? Well, we've got a, something like 21 or $22 trillion gross domestic product, uh, product, and we're trying to bail people out with $2 trillion. So this, this $11.1 .1 billion a year spent on storage is peanuts compared to what's presumably being spent just to pay people for not being employed because they can't get their job back. So as we emerge from this pandemic, there is a possibility some of them very interesting shifts may occur in what people do for a living because there's an awful lot of jobs that are going to be available in this area. Okay. Um, Here's where the storage is more likely to go and, and looks like Texas is in really good shape. Florida's not bad for storage. California's not too bad. Not a whole lot of storage in Nevada or Idaho. But anyway, again, this is a study back in, uh, in, in, in 2012 uh, that shows where the opportunity are for storage. The point being everywhere is possible to do some kind of regional storage, not just rooftop or a few batteries in your garage. Okay. Um, here's the land use. All right. Good question. Uh, obviously, the pump storage hydro uses more land than the other technologies. Okay. Um, water use is another interesting thing. The compressed air energy storage uses water for cooling, about two tenths of a gallon per kilowatt hour. Pump storage hydro, makeup water, about two tenths of a, three tenths of a gallon per. But when you get into making electricity with the sun, there's no cooling water necessary there. Uh, you may need a little bit of water to wash them off once in a while. Okay. So here's some of the barriers that have been identified. Obviously, you don't, if you don't know what the barriers are, then you don't know what problems you have to solve. But here we go. Um, batteries are, have been expensive and limited cycle life, but they're getting better. Okay, and uh, here's this, the, the way to approach the problem. Uh, do some research. And uh, that's going on like crazy right now. And a lot of it's being sponsored by the companies themselves and by uh, investors. Uh, here's the question. Let's see what we got. Ideal power capacity range today for flywheel technology and what current technologies are required to minimize parasitic losses. Uh, 
Okay. The, the flywheel that I think you'll see a picture of at the end of this presentation is, I believe, rated at a megawatt. Um, <clears throat> you can, again, you can do the math on this. If you know the moment of inertia and if you know how fast you can spin it, then your energy is a half I omega squared. So that gives you some idea of how big something might need to be. And if you know the density of steel or whatever you're going to make it out of, maybe the stainless steel. I, I don't have, I, I can't really tell you what ideal is. I can tell you that there is a commercialized uh, megawatt and maybe the person who had the, uh, the uh, flywheels might be able to pop in and give us some idea what the size of those were. I think maybe you did and maybe I erased the answer. So uh, if you could comment on that again, that would help us here. And uh, it's another thing I learned that uh, nobody can know everything and not even me. And, and, and it kind of, uh, I mean, I'm always embarrassed when I don't know the answers, but I also know that uh, that means you're just smarter than me and that's good anyway. Okay, so ideal pass in and what current technologies are required to minimize parasitic losses? <clears throat> um, let's see now, what, uh, I guess, are you talking about just plain losses parasitic that would be bearing losses, uh, uh, wind losses? Maybe if you could be a little more specific on that question of uh, what kind of parasitic losses. Um, there are a number of well, again, that's mechanical engineering, and uh, I'm an electrical engineer, and i be honest with you, I have not been following uh, really closely the flywheel technologies and what they're doing to minimize parasitic losses. So I have to, Steve, I'm sorry, I have to refer you to uh, Google to see if you can get an answer to that. So, Okay, here we go. Um, again, these are, we might even have to add your questions to this, this chart here, that uh, what's happening in order to make sure we're okay here. Uh, here's comment or question, realistic expectation. I can tell you, Robert, that I've got good expectations <clears throat> of uh, large battery storage for wayside energy storage for mass rail transit. Um, uh, maybe you're talking about Long Island Railroad lines like that. <clears throat> there are plenty of places along that railroad where fairly good sized storage technology could be implemented to empower, apply power to that system. So uh, uh, mass See, mostly what's happened is that we want to put these battery storage in convenient places where uh, they maybe take up a place that nobody wanted to live there anyway. And it, you just feed the grid. It's kind of like saying, do I want to put a photovoltaic system on my house to run the air conditioner? And the answer to that is no. You want to put a photovoltaic system on your house that feeds your main distribution panel so that whatever wants to use that electricity will use it. And uh, then you add some storage if you want to take into account time of use pricing. So it's, uh, yes, if you put your mass storage closer to the rail system, then the getting it, <clears throat> the electricity there and back is a little bit less expensive. But wherever you can put it, uh, electricity moves back and forth in the wires. Okay, you're talking New York City subway system. Um, you talk about the above ground part of the subway system or the underground part? Um, and again, I think the answer is going to be the same. <clears throat> you need to find a place to put the batteries and you need to be able to feed that, uh, the power source from the batteries. And I think you'll probably, uh, there may be even some more storage batteries. Once it gets light enough, it might be economical to have a little bit of storage on the, uh, the trains themselves. Can you imagine 
I mean, uh, well, I guess the trains are electric anyway. So, all right. Uh, let's see, we got to, uh, here's some more barriers. Okay. And again, this is a lot of fine print. And again, you can, uh, uh, again, we're talking about what's it going to take to be able to implement all these different kinds of uh, large scale energy storage. And some small, some of the large scale is meaning millions and millions of small scale units, like in, for example, electric vehicle battery packs. Um, here's a summary of uh, storage characteristics for a lot of different things. How long does it take to build them? What are their operating parameters, discharge time? Uh, and, and you can see that, uh, you know, flywheels operating cost is very low and very low, very small space requirement among the smallest of all, uh, right in there with lithium ion batteries. All right. And uh, the nice attractive thing about flywheels, here's your, uh, how many cycles will they do? And, uh, Flywheels, 100,000 cycles, that's pretty nice. Uh, compare that with pump storage hydro over 10,000 cycles. But what does that mean? Well, it means you may need to do a little overhauling on, on some of those big generators, the mechanical rotating generators. So <clears throat> again, it, and also commentary on the maturity of the technology. And Pretty much everything's commercial. It's just the flow batteries and the flywheels are uh, are coming, uh, and and by 2030 they ought to be in in in, in very large application because the the uh, dollars per kilowatt hour of storage is uh, relatively lower on these technologies, and they are improving on them significantly. <coughs> so I'm going to build this storage thing, and I want to get a group of investors together and invest in it. And they're going to say, what's my return on investment? And we're going to have to say, well, we're going to have to go to the public service commission or the public utilities commission and ask them what we can charge the utility because we might get regulated or at least we'll be in, in, in competition. So these are what storage gives to the grid. And a large portion is just energy time shifting. You, you make the energy at one time and you use it at another time. Peak shaving, you can see significant value of the total value of storage is in reducing peak demand. Talk to the lady who's the president of the utility up in Vermont. She'll tell you about how much money they save every month by using storage to reduce their peak demand when they're buying at wholesale. Reliability and resiliency. You got backup power here. Grid infrastructure congestion relief. You're distributing the storage into the neighborhoods so that you don't have to bring all this power in on long transmission lines that overheat and droop and cause outages. <clears throat> and then there's the ancillary services. You know, you got to maintain these things and you got to have the control systems and, and everything is necessary in order for them to work the way they're supposed to work. So these are five of the factors that go into how pricing will be arranged. And of course, this means this has to be cheaper than any other option. And there may be an environmental aspect as well, because you notice it doesn't say anything about environmental on this chart. These are all just things that are routine everyday things and uh, have nothing to do with carbon dioxide. Okay, so here's what IREC thinks, Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Here's things what they think we need to do and I'm right in line with agreeing with them on this. Again, I'm just gonna click these in because I wanna <clears throat> allow a little time at the end to open all the, uh, unmute everybody and have a, whatever discussion you like. So again, uh, this is what needs to be done foundationally 
you know, here's your public utility condition uh, and, 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 and maybe the legislatures and local town councils and county commissions and so forth. These are things that need to happen. And here's a picture of a microgrid, just so you have an idea. We talked about at the very beginning, a kind of a system you put in a single building, maybe a 10,000 watt system in a house. Okay, but there's no reason why you can't expand this whole concept with putting an energy management center in a community where you've got wind generation, solar generation, fuel cell generation, new generation that nobody has any idea what it's going to be yet, even a diesel generator and gas turbines. And you got all these houses and churches and big buildings and loads in this place. So this microgrid could be a city. And they, the main grid goes down and this substation just disconnects from the main grid and says, well, guys, uh, we're just going to run up through the energy, energy management center, this whole <clears throat> neighborhood, rather than leaving everybody on their own. So this is, these are coming. Uh, Marathi is a uh, uh, young lady who got her PhD in 2017 <clears throat> and happens to be working on these kinds of concepts now at Next Era up in Riviera Beach, Florida. So uh, and it was very interesting. I was on her, her committee and uh, she did some really nice work. So here's what you try to do with a microgrid. Okay, I went through there a little bit too fast. I could back up, but again, you can see the idea. Here's, uh, can you imagine what that might be? Pretty obvious that's pumped hydro, okay. There's your megawatt sized flywheel. And I'm pretty sure this is one of those slow batteries. And here, I know this, this is a lithium battery here, number 342. And that's a flow battery bank on the right hand side. Uh, you walk around on a, because there's liquids. And if those liquids get on the floor, some of those electrolytes are uh, uh, maybe what you don't want to walk in and track home on your shoes or into your car. So, folks, we've got 10 minutes. And uh, I'm going to ask that everybody be allowed to open their microphones. And let's see. Uh, let's see, can we do that? Or maybe we'd have to just do it on, on typing them in. Uh, Hisham, I forgot to ask you about that. Uh, okay, here's something flashing on chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, you can, you, you, you can, uh, you're unmuted at the, the host, so you now can unmute yourself by finding your microphone and unmute, so uh, I can't see where you are, so uh, We'll just, I, I mean, I, can, I guess if you want to raise a hand, I might be able to see a raise hand that, that you'll find that on your participant uh, if you want to click the raise hand. But I think it's been working okay by just go ahead if you want to discuss or if you prefer typing in, uh, we'll be looking for, if you type in, type into the Q&A and uh, we'll watch those. So any, any comments? Uh, questions, discussion items. Let's do it on Q&A then, okay? There were a couple things that we talked about earlier that I kind of hurried through. Oh, we could talk a little bit more about electric vehicles. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Let's look for Q and A's. Let, let some, give give uh, something you, a topic you'd like to discuss. Okay, here's one. Oh, okay. Uh, cars and Powerwalls. 
first of all, let, let's acknowledge what a power wall is. The most recent power wall will provide somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 kilowatt hours of electricity at about 5,000 watts. These mount on the wall, that's why they call them power wall, and they have built in rectifier so that you can have DC in and they have a built-in inverter which gives you AC out. You can also, actually they have built-in rectifier which means you can have AC in. You can charge them with AC because they have a rectifier built in and then you can take AC back out of them. All right, and we'll do that simply. So, so that therefore, uh, Power walls right now are kind of expensive. Uh, I wouldn't worry about using a power wall for just for the car. Uh, if you can get a bi-directional charger for the car though, then that car effectively becomes a power wall because you've got an in and out and some control functions that can, can control when it comes in and out, okay? So let's see, uh, let's go up here to central receiver solar system fit into possible future power sources. Uh, yeah, okay, you're talking about the, those huge solar power towers that they're building in desert areas. The central receivers, they need, uh, for one thing, they need direct sunlight, diffuse sunlight, cloudy areas, not very good place for central receiver systems, whether it's a trough or whether it's a mirror system, whatever it is. On the other hand, they are really great for thermal storage because if you heat up a fluid like uh, liquid sodium, for example, up to around 800 degrees, and then store it and use it at night, that takes away some of the flexibility and some of the variability that would otherwise be uh, in that uh, renewable source. So um, I, I think we're going to use all of the above here, and I think the central receiver system is, in fact, going to see a lot of use out in the western United States. Okay, and uh, so now power wall could speak more of the Vermont utilities. Um, you know, I think I, on that one, that's kind of a long answer, but basically they are buying electricity from outside and that electricity is uh, the, is on a peak demand type schedule just like you would have a demand schedule general uses general service demand on a uh, uh, say a business or, or a factory so when they're buying wholesale power if they buy it at the wrong time of day when there's not very much available they have to pay more for it so they buy it when it's cheap and they store it and you can read about it. Uh, I wish I could remember the name of the utility, but I can't. I know that uh, I read an article. There is a woman who is president who has done some very creative things to the extent that I almost wanted to move to Vermont. And I would encourage you to Google that and find that article. I wish I could give you more information, but uh, it is really interesting, and that uh, doesn't necessarily have to apply to a Vermont utility either. It applies to anybody, including having a power wall in your garage. But then you'd want to you'd ask your utility to put you on a time of use rate. Uh, you don't have to be on a peak on a general service demand rate. You can just be on time of use rate so that uh, you can sell back to the utility when the electricity is expensive. Uh, let's see, that's from Michael. Nick, let's see, first glance at the issue is the garage batteries are not nearly as large capacity as a car battery. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, but you can put, uh, let's see, I forgot now, you'd have to look it up in the Tesla specs. I think you can parallel eight of those batteries. Uh, so that gets you up in the 100 uh, megawatt hour range, or 100 kilowatt hour range. Um, let's see, oh, I gotta scroll down here. That's what's happening here. Uh, it appears that the deal is a lot better in the car. In other words, using the car battery as, as a battery backup rather than 
the uh, power wall. And again, that's one you got to do the math on. Uh, power walls are probably going to, price is probably going to go down. Price of electric cars is going to go down. And so the answer to any comment like Nick's here is that uh, you just have to do the math in order to decide what's your better situation. And of course, power wall is not the only, only answer. There are lithium DC battery packs that can be made in very large sizes so that you don't need a separate inverter on every single pack. <clears throat> you can have a single larger inverter and a single larger charger. And that may be another direction that uh, people will decide they want to go. Let's see, there may be a few others. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cer certainly, <clears throat> I, I see, if you do the math on this, it's amazing because uh, there's something, I, I think 180 million passenger vehicles in, this, in, in the United States alone. And imagine 180 million of them having available even five kilowatts each. Uh, the, 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 they, they can actually, and, and then you look at that 100, the, the, the storage needs depending on the six different scenarios. And electric vehicles can meet a significant fraction of that storage need uh, without having to you know, build all these fancy big things and the storage is in your own garage now and so, or maybe at a public parking space. So I, yeah, I see some amazing uh, possibilities here. And your question, Fred, about the Tesla Gigafactory for lithium batteries, is it practical? I, I guess we're gonna find out in two years, aren't we? Um, you're going to have to talk to Elon Musk about that one. I'm not sure. Had somebody who worked for Tesla at one of the previous uh, uh, webinars. I wonder if that person wouldn't happen to be here. That would be great if so. It's my opinion that renewable system power cost is less than natural gas generation include the additional cost of transmission and losses due to need to locate wind systems often very far from the intended users of the power. Well, here, the key words are your opinion. All right, Steve, because what I've got is I'm looking at data that comes off uh, <clears throat> out, out of National Renewable Energy Labs, where they've, uh, I think they take into account, and when they say six cents levelized cost of energy, that is an average value, and it's gonna be higher if there's more transmission needed uh, and, and yeah, all of these things. So, so don't let me <laughs> convince you that this is all a real simple thing because there has to be a lot of analysis and that's why we teach math. And every decision hopefully will be based on facts. Uh, I just got a, a, a t-shirt for my birthday that said, fight truth decay. <laughs> and, and that's our job as engineers. We got to get the facts out as to what the costs, the real costs are, and are there any hidden costs? And if so, we need to bring them to the surface. So thank you for that comment, Steve, because, uh, uh, you know, every system, uh, sometimes building a huge plant somewhere a little further away justifies the cost of a longer transmission line. The other interesting thing on transmission lines is when you get into DC transmission lines and look at what, uh, take a look at what the Chinese are doing with DC transmission lines that are transmitting over distances of 1600 kilometers at, at voltages uh, in, in the uh, million volt range. So things, when trans electricity has to be transmitted over longer distances, then it's generally done on DC. They just built another DC transmission line up in Newfoundland that goes all the way from Labrador to St. John's. And uh, they apparently decided it's a lot cheaper to use that hydropower up in Labrador at St. John's, even though they had to build a real long DC transmission line to do that. So again, kind of a long answer, but uh, this is an answer. There's a lot of studies that have been done and there are a lot of 
commercially DC transmission line, North Dakota to Minnesota, Oregon to California, and so forth, and a lot of them, more than you would believe in China. So check that out, and we do have more information on some of these and some of the other programs. So uh, let's see, where are we here? Another more? Pretty soon I'm going to get a message from uh, what's the increase in national energy production and charge? Okay. Uh, the answer is it's. I figured for my car, if I wanted to charge it all from the sun, I would need, and of course I have a problem doing it because I live in a, a condominium and we don't have room for solar in this space. But it would uh, a 1500 watt solar system would take, produce all the electricity we need to run our electric car. Uh, and, and even though it's a, a plug-in hybrid, we have not bought gasoline since before Christmas. Uh, so it, it's a concern, but not serious, because th th there's another thing that's going to happen here. Uh, I, I'm going to call you Bob Ziegler, and, and that is energy efficiency is moving really, really fast as well. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the service calculation from 30 years ago for a building using all incandescent light bulbs or whatever, and now we look at uh, uh, LEDs that are 10 times more efficient and motors that are a lot more efficient, refrigerators a whole lot more efficient. So energy efficiency is making a huge difference in the amount, in, in the load itself. So part of the electricity for the cars is going to come from reduced loads due to the implementation of energy efficiency. In fact, uh, it's now easy to show that you can build a zero energy building almost anywhere in the United States and the additional cost to build it as a zero energy building is overcome by the reduced electric bill the, you know, the savings. So in other words, the savings in electricity is so much more than the additional mortgage cost that it's almost crazy not to build a zero energy building. Again, another webinar. So uh, folks, you come up with some really good uh, questions and discussion. I've enjoyed it immensely. It uh, completely taken out of my mind that I fell and banged my cheek really hard this morning. And so uh, I think, uh, let's see, what do we got for time? Yeah, it's 4.05. So I think we're going to have to call it off here, but uh, I encourage you to, uh, uh, if you like this material, we've got some that are a whole lot more design oriented with all the gory details of wire sizing. Um, uh, look on, uh, on the PDH website and we'd be happy to see you. We're doing one once a month and uh, be glad to see you another time. Central receiver, if there's any comment, car for part, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. I never thought that the answer to a lot of questions was I'd say, just go to the web, you'll find it. So I enjoyed it a lot. And if you enjoyed it one tenth as much as I did, then you've had a worthwhile afternoon. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.